I have the delightful pleasure of announcing that the trustees have recently decided to create a new position of Goodwill Ambis Ambassador. This is to be awarded to individuals who have exceptional commitment, knowledge, experience or contributions to Tibetan culture and people. The aim is to honour these individuals and also to enable them to support and promote the Foundation's work. So today, we have the great pleasure of announcing the appointment of Tibet Foundation's first Goodwill Ambassador, who's Mr. John Billington. <laughs> John is a former chairman of the Tibet Society and a very long-time advocate, political campaigner for Free Tibet and a supporter of Tibetan people and culture since uh, the 1950s, I believe, isn't it? If that doesn't date you too much, John. <laughs> He's made many visits to India and also had many meetings with His Holiness Dalai Lama and many of you will know him from excellent talks that he's given to the Foundation previously and also some of his wonderful articles that he's contributed now and again to the newsletter. I would also point out to you there's a fantastic YouTube of him being interviewed which I was actually watching this morning and uh, very interesting John all the stories of your early life and how you first got inspired to write a letter to his holiness and then eventually to go and meet him so it's my great pleasure to invite John to come and accept this award and to say a few words for us John please Well, I would like to obviously thank the trustees for their confidence in nominating me as the first Goodwill Ambassador. I must confess that when they first asked me, I was actually rather diffident in accepting, partly because I'm older than I look. I'm in my 80s, and also because I live a long way away from London. I live in Mid Wales. But the fact that Tibet is still an unresolved issue... The fact that it's in danger at times of being forgotten and the fact that it's such a worthwhile cause made me change my mind and say, I must do what I can. So what little I can, I try to do. Um, Tibet, it goes without saying, is unique. That's a cliche, but Tibet really is unique. Geographers often describe Tibet as being the third pole because of its high altitude and the hostile environment. Just one ethnic group tamed that very difficult terrain, the Tibetans. And they held that terrain unmolested until 1950, when for the first time a serious incursions of population were made on what hitherto they had run as a Tibetan culture. Now, they not only tamed that environment, but they made it friendly and cheerful. I've traveled a good deal in Tibet, uh, both in vehicles and on foot. And wherever you go, Colourful prayer flags, wayside shrines, mani, stones, greet you and make the place warm and friendly. And in these vast empty spaces, because Tibet is really high altitude desert, in those vast empty spaces you are welcome. And it's a welcome which has at the back of it devotion because it's a very religious area. Empty spaces and deserts lend themselves to religious thoughts. We have just seen in these monks something of Tibetan culture and the sacredness with which they hold the environment and all life and the 
way in which they pursue the inner life. There is a lot Tibet has got to teach the West. In my opinion, and I've held this for 60 years, since I first came across Tibetan culture, about which I had read previously, but I came across it when I went out to India in 1958, um, I became certain that Tibetan culture was among the top 25% of cultures in the world. It is therefore enormously important that we preserve it. Um, now, uh, the twin pillars, of course, of Tibetan Buddhism are wisdom and compassion, something also we could do with in the West. Um, there are approximately 7 million Tibetans and 1.4 billion Chinese. That's a ratio of one Tibetan to 200 Chinese. Um, Tibetans, like the snow leopard and the Siberian tiger, are an endangered <coughs> species. They are rare, they are very valuable. And because they are rare and valuable, we must do what we can to help them. Um, I'm, right. Now, I'm a great optimist, and I'll give you a few thoughts. In 1991, after 74 years of communism, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, broke up into 15 states, which had not existed for many decades previously. Armenia, Latvia, Moldova, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and 10 others. One year later, in 1990, Yugoslavia broke up and produced seven nations. Um, they are uh, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, North Macedonia, and Croatia. In two years, 22 countries which had disappeared came back into existence. And that was a great, a great uh, time for those nations. Now, communism in China has existed since 1949, and your maths will tell you that's 70 years. So in four years' time, <laughs> we must hope that communism will run its course in China, and that China will break up, as it has periodically done, and that out of that hoped-for breakup, Tibet certainly, Xinjiang, certainly, possibly Inner Mongolia, possibly Manchuria, but possibly even Sichuan, I don't know, but other countries which have disappeared into the sort of maw of Chinese communism will come back into being. That is my hope, it is my belief. I believe they will. Um, <laughs> the, the signs, I think, are encouraging. Reports coming out of Xinjiang, very authoritative and good reports, suggest that Xinjiang is a large concentration camp in which millions of Muslims are incarcerated and forcibly indoctrinated to believe that they are actually Chinese when they're not. The governor of Xinjiang was formerly the governor of Tibet and therefore is well familiar with how to repress people. Um, in Hong Kong, we are seeing a wonderfully exciting exhibition, both by students and their supporters, of the demand for greater freedom, freedom from centralized control. That's the second. And thirdly, inside China itself, this is something you may not know so much about because we don't get so much reports, but I believe that among the middle classes and the educated, there is increasing impatience with the restrictions of communism and increasing demand for greater freedom and self, of self-expression and elsewhere. So those are reasons for hope. What we are seeing in China, and perhaps other parts of the world, is a conflict between the forces of centralized control and individual freedom. And I was there last year with Punzhou. Very impressive. 
in many ways, all sorts of things, but also rather frightening. When I came out, I reread 1984 and Brave New World because it is a highly surveyed society. Everywhere you go, you are monitored. Your every movement is being photographed and recorded and can be held against you. Now, that is a, a level of centralized control which we in the West have not seen yet, and I don't think we will see. But um, it is it's rather terrifying. However, that sort of centralized control is actually very weak. It appears to be powerful, but it's not. It's actually fearful. It is fearful of freedom. It does not allow people to hold alternative opinions because alternative opinions would threaten it. The Tibetan way of life, which suggests that happiness may be achieved by means other than material consumption, is a threat to communism. It's a threat to the central government. They dare not allow Tibetans to have their own opinions because it would, it would threaten their monolithic truth. But truth is not monolithic, and no one government has a monopoly of it. So, um, in the West also, we becoming, as well as those bits of information I've given you about um, uh, um, what's going on in China, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang, we've become increasingly and rightly suspicious of the underground surveillance by Huawei, the uh, telecommunications company, which we had blithely ignored. We've also become aware that the Confucius Institutes in British universities and others, and also in some secondary schools, are not what they appear to be, that is to say, friendly, generous handouts from the Communist Party of China, but they're actually designed to monitor and to influence academic thought in favor of Chinese view of history and to stifle any expression of alternative views. So if you go to a university campus in the UK and try to suggest support of Tibet, you'll be shouted down by Chinese supporters who say, that's not true. That, the fact that we're aware of this now, much more than we were 10 years ago, is another welcome development. In any case, we can be assured the voice of individual freedom will always win. Always. In my lifetime, in the lifetime of many of you, Alexander Dubček, 1968 in Czechoslovakia, Lech Walesa in Poland in the 1980s, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, His Holiness the Dalai Lama on behalf of Tibet, Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, the student, the Chinese student in his white shirt and plastic handbags who confronted the tanks in Tiananmen Square. Those are powerful symbols of the determination of the individual to be free from centralized oppressive control. They will always go like that. So I am confident that you know the monolithic Communist Party will eventually break up and it will, um, Tibet must be ready to take advantage of that. I'm nearly finishing, but I'll just say one more thing. Any of you who are parents will know that you can control children when they're very young and dependent. But when they grow older, they want to think their own thoughts. And if you've got any sense, you will let them go. If you want your children to be your friends in the future, let them go. If China had any sense, it would let Tibet and Xinjiang go. It is sheer stupidity that thinks they can, you can hold these people down forever. It is not the way. Um, now, um, China claims that it needs Tibet and Xinjiang to protect its, for security, but that is just deceit. No neighboring country threatens China. 
And it knows that perfectly well. It is not being threatened. And actually, it would be a lot safer if Tibet became again what it was, and East Turkestan, Xinjiang became what it was, buffer states against other big nations. And those states would be friendly with China if China were only to have enough sense to see that they should be free to run themselves. It would also save them an awful lot of expense on standing armies, which they have to have for repressing people. We here must seek to persuade our Chinese brothers and sisters, they are our brothers and sisters, of the truth. Um, I'll just finally say a word or two about uh, the Tibet Foundation. I said at the start, Tibet is unique. The Tibet Foundation is also unique. Um, the, it is, of course, charitable, not political, but its scope, you know, I won't repeat it because you, you know what it does, but I'm particularly impressed about the work it does, particularly inside Tibet and in Mongolia in the support of the culture of Tibet. Um, um, what impresses me too is the fact that it's uniquely, largely run by Tibetans. And Tibetans who listen carefully to what our Tibetan brothers and sisters inside occupied Tibet want. Now that is its great selling point, its great strength. And I've long been an admirer of the work that Pulsar Wangil and the Tibet Foundation has done. Uh, its funds are unusually well directed and intelligently spent because they do research on the ground. It's from the ground up, not us in the West telling them what we think they need. Um, all of us here are united in our concern for Tibet. All of us here are goodwill ambassadors. All of us have got a duty to do what we can to speak the truth about Tibet and the way in which it is Autonomy is a pure fiction. It does not have any autonomy. Um, and at the same time, all of us, I think, should continue to fund the Tun Foundation's projects to the best of our ability, help with ongoing things and with the projects which are planned, including the work for the elderly next year. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>